Uh, greetings, my name is Sean Butler. I'm a fellow of St. Edmund's College in Cambridge. Um, and I'm also director of the Cambridge Centre for Animal Rights Law. So um, thank you very much for the invitation to give a brief talk to you today. Um, and congratulations to uh, Sanjay and his colleagues uh, in the Ahimsa farm. I think you're doing a terrific job. So I want to talk about a couple of things. First of all, first of all about animal rights law, and secondly, about how that fits in with what Ahimsa is doing, what the foundation is doing. Um, let's start with animal rights law. Uh, some of you may be aware uh, animals don't have rights. Um, they benefit from animal welfare laws. Now, these have been around for a long time, um, 200 years in the UK, a similar amount of time in some of the states in the United States, um, slightly less in Europe and other countries, but a long time and been well established, certainly through the last 100 years, 150 years. Um, and they've grown in significance, uh, in breadth and depth in terms of how they affect the lives of animals. Um, and certainly the last 50 or 60 years, there's been an increasing knowledge, understanding that animals are sentient, that they have feelings and care about each other, and, uh, have preferences, uh, can feel pleasure, can feel pain and so on. Um, and that has been translated, if you like, into laws, statutes and regulations. Some of you may be aware of the new Sentience Act that came out in the UK uh, just recently. Um, a number of laws in the UK and Europe uh, recognize that animals are sentient uh, and therefore regulations, animal welfare regulations, are designed to re recognize and, and hopefully respect that. But animal welfare laws have limits. And the main limit they have is that they simply regulate how we traditionally deal with animals, um, our relationship with them. And of course, a significant um, aspect of the relationship is eating them. Um, we kill and eat animals for meat. And as far as animal welfare laws are concerned, that is um, proper and legal um, and quite acceptable. Um, what animal welfare is concerned with are not whether you kill an animal uh, and eat it, but um, how you look after it um, uh, and, and what happens at the point of killing. So things like stunning animals before slaughter. Um, so animal welfare laws are terribly important and have made a significant difference and improvement to the lives of millions and billions of animals, but limited by um, being regulations on people. Um, what animal welfare laws do not do is to re-examine, if you like, or challenge the basic premise of uh, how do we treat animals? Are we treating them properly? Are we treating them with respect? And that's where animal rights comes in. And the idea of animal rights, which has a much shorter history than animal welfare, but is still well established, the idea of animal welfare is that animals actually, uh, unlike animal welfare, that animal rights actually respect right animals as individuals. It gives them rights. And it would give them really quite significant rights. Um, the right to life, uh, for example. In other words, animals uh, living in a country where there was animal rights could not be killed for sport could not be killed um, for food. So animal rights is a potentially massively significant uh, um, opportunity or change. And it'll have a massive effect on society and uh, what we eat um, would have an effect on, on zoos um, on, and uh, of course on animal experimentation. So that brings me to the Ahimsa Dairy Foundation. And what has always intrigued me about Ahimsa is whether and to what extent it is compatible with animal rights. And my sense is that it is actually compatible with a regime of animal rights. 
Um, some people, it is true, feel that if we had animal rights, animals would no longer be property. We could no longer keep them. Uh, we could no longer have uh, animal farms. Um, so the basic process, uh, some people equate it with exploitation and therefore would argue that that you, you can't have uh, farms like hymns or anywhere else. But others, and I think I'm probably among them, think that in a post-animal rights world, there will be farms, um, there will be uh, relationships between uh, uh, people and farmed animal businesses so that we will continue for example to have milk from animals we perhaps will continue to get wool uh, from sheep and goats the issue will be how it's done clearly there won't be animals kept on farms for slaughter but of course that's not what the hymns of dairy foundation is about um, and it seems to me that what the hymns of farm is doing is um, respecting, acknowledging some of the basic principles of animal rights. So first of all, clearly no kill. Secondly, respect for the individual animal. Thirdly, recognizing that the animal can make choices and respecting those choices. Uh, fourthly, uh, at a very practical level, for example, keeping calves with their mother um, for many months until the calves um, are ready to, to to live more independently um and of course um keeping animals both bulls and cows who are no longer able to give milk keeping them uh, comfortably uh, for the rest of their lives so it is quite possible quite likely that over the next that that, that in a system of animal rights law places like farms like the hymns of dairy foundation will continue now, the question, final question put to me was, well, you know, what part can it play? What role can it play over the next five to 10 years in improving animal welfare? And I think the answer is doing what it's doing, being open, being accessible, having visitors. But more than that, perhaps encouraging other farms to set up in the same way and helping other farmers to realize that if and when animal rights does come into play, uh, a hymns are like farms will almost certainly survive and thrive and in fact be hopefully what people think farming means thank you very much